Hi there, and welcome to the Explaining History podcast. Um, the topic I want to talk about today is inspired by a brilliant book I've been reading, um, KL, or uh, Concentration Lager, uh, by Niklaus Vashman. A superb piece of scholarship on the development of uh, concentration camps in the Third Reich. Notice that it talks primarily about concentration camps, um, not the uh, uh, development of death camps during the Second World War. Now that, of course, is covered in the book. There's a clear uh, difference and substantial substantial difference between the two. Uh, the, the reason I want to talk about this book and the scholarship that's being done is because it helps to, um, it, it has helped in my reading to... Um, add complexity to the study of Nazi Germany. Now, as a UK history teacher, I can't help but feel that there is, we've reached peak Hitler. The uh, the country's obsessional um, study of Nazi Germany has had a number of unfortunate consequences in my mind. Firstly, we, if anything, over-teach it and people graduate from school believing that nothing else of any consequence really happened in the history of the 20th century and start by assuming that any study of history really is just endless lessons about Hitler. Also, we tend to um, teach it in a paint-by-numbers prosaic way and add apply simplicity where complexity is um, really important. And by that, I mean that some of the the notions that we have about Nazi Germany, particularly the development of concentration camps, are um, acquired from school and acquired in a uh, often a quite misleading way. The idea that um, after the Reichstag fire that the communists were rounded up and it was as simple as that. Really, uh, from uh, Nicholas Vashman's work, um, we, has been blown out of the water. So what I want to talk um, today, really, is, is a kind of a journey that I guess we almost take as history students from simplicity to complexity. And we've got to be happy with that. We've got to be happy with ambiguity. We've got to be happy with confusion. We've got to be happy with things not making sense, particularly the image that an authoritarian regime like that of um, Nazi Germany was one which functioned effectively. Um, And it clearly, if we're to look at the example of the development of its camps, it didn't. The men who ran the camps initially uh, were drawn from the SA, from the brown shirts. They were selected for their brutality and they uh, they had already proven um, through years of street fighting, that they were brutal. Um, initially, when the uh, the Reichstag fire occurred and there was uh, a wave of mass arrests, the um, communists, socialists and trade unionists who were arrested, along with the kind of the, the general milieu of left intellectuals, bohemians, writers, artists, and people with sympathetic to communist and left-wing views, when these people um, are arrested, they're arrested by the police and transferred to the regular prison service, and their treatment very often isn't that brutal. There are police officers who um, perhaps don't necessarily share their views, but don't really see them as a particular threat to the state, and don't really see them as uh, sort of socialists and communists and trade unionists as anything particularly to be feared and incarcerate them with a a kind of a firm and yet relatively benign attitude. And when the the handover happens within a couple of weeks of the uh, the purge of the communists and the the communists are handed over into the hands of the brown shirts, um, that's when the, the real brutality begins. The brown shirts see this as the culmination of everything that's happened since 1918. Many brown shirts who had been in the Nazi movement 
uh, almost from the beginnings, or they had been in the Freikorps movement since the end of the First World War, believed that they had fought an epic battle for uh, a decade and a half for Germany's soul, and that they had won, and now scores must be settled. The real frightening thing for a socialist winding up in one of the new concentration camps was to be recognised, was to know one of their jailers. And this was um, quite common. Um, I shall explain why in a, in a moment. But it was quite common for um, socialists from one particular town to wind up in a concentration camp in that town and to have uh, the local brown shirts who they had been fighting with or frightened of for a long period of time as their new jailers. And if a, a, um, a, a brown shirt did recognise um, one of their new uh, inmates, then they were determined to make their life as miserable as possible. The actual prisons themselves um, range from the existing state prisons um, that very quickly overflow, not just with uh, communists, but with uh, regular criminals too. The Nazis um, were a, claimed to be a party of law and order and wished to pursue criminal law to its um, absolute ends, uh, as well as the new, um, uh, the, the new uh, crusade against political uh, criminals as they saw them. So both regular criminals and um, political prisoners uh, filled the regular state prisons that had existed throughout Wilhelmine Germany and through the uh, Weimar Republic. Um, one of the reasons for the rapid development of concentration camps is that the regular prison system reaches saturation but it also was uh, important to develop concentration camps because these were almost extrajudicial sites. These were places where the Nazis could do things that were um, effectively beyond the law. The Nazis were able to um, torture and they were able to um, encourage inmates to commit suicide. Very rarely did SA men actually commit murder themselves? Uh, because once I say these sites were largely beyond the law, um, an effective rule of law of sorts still operates in Nazi Germany, and the courts could investigate murders um, and ensure that guilty parties were punished. So uh, whilst this power wanes over the years, um, it was often more trouble than it was worth to directly commit flagrant acts of murder within camps. Uh, instead, there were more subtle ways of providing an inmate with a belt and making their life so uh, miserable that they would gladly uh, take it after, after a while. The um, camps has also developed in an extremely ad hoc and disorganised way. The idea that this is a centrally organised and coordinated initiative with um, um, inspired planning from a, uh, uh, you know, a, a villainous and yet brilliant leader is, is really not supported by the facts. What uh, appears to be the case is that um, the brown shirts and the newly um, Nazi-fied uh, Gauleiters in, uh, across the regions in Germany um, were setting up camps um, alongside uh, the SA um, with impunity, and they were taking initiative. One key feature of Nazism was that um, Hitler, as the inspired leader um, and the, the, kind of the inspirational leader, took little interest in bureaucracy and little interest in petty, what he viewed as petty fucking bureaucratic manners and believed that um, you know, little fewers, little leaders at local level needed to take the initiative and to, um, um, to, to, to step up and make their own decisions. And so as a result, there's this quite famous quote by a, um, a former Nazi after the period saying, you know, in 1933, everyone was arresting everyone. 
um, the there were um, brown shirt men um, essentially kidnapping uh, socialists or uh, people they simply didn't like the look of off the streets and taking them away to camps, very you know um, improvised uh, camps, and progressively uh, ones which are progressively smaller and smaller. Um, some you couldn't really class as a camp at all um, or a prison of, of sorts merely some back rooms behind a beer keller or a bar that the SA uh, frequent where beatings and tortures take place and so this is really um, extrajudicial imprisonment um, and it is a very chaotic uh, terror one that Hitler doesn't seem to be wholly in charge of a lot of the aspects of this terror are extremely uh, unappealing to some of um, the the people that Hitler tries to reach out to the most, i.e. Germany's middle classes, for the period from January to about uh, June 1933, the SA are by and large a law unto themselves. And it is this kind of uh, law unto themselves aspect of things which I think leaves Hitler rather troubled and thinking about his own his own future. One of the things that greatly empowered the SA was the uh, creation of this idea of protective custody, that anyone could be arrested at any time following Hitler's suspension of the Constitution. And the justification behind all of this was that the individual was actually being taken into protective custody to protect them against something or other. Probably the justification would be, well, we need to protect you, you're an enemy of the people, and the, the people might decide that they wish to take out kind of some sort of vengeance upon you. And the reality was, of course, that everyone knew this was a nonsense and that uh, individuals would be coerced at first, probably by Gestapo men, or regular police into signing a protective custody order, taken to a regular prison, and from there they would be handed over to the SA. As previously mentioned, when um, the protective custody prisoners or politicals were in regular prisons, for a lot of the time, initially, things were, were at least bearable. They weren't mingling with the criminal prisoners, often quite a, a, a rough experience. And by and large kept um, themselves to themselves, um, or were housed together on particular wings of the prison. But when they were are transferred into the hands of the SA, then things dramatically change. Um, initially, the uh, attitude of the SA doesn't seem to be um, tempered by a kind of an, an overall uh, ideological. Um, initiative. Later on, the camps are used by uh, Heinrich Himmler as places where the kind of new characters, new kinds of people are forged and created, where the bad old ways of um, socialism and an idleness which Himmler believes seems to go with it. Um, these are, are worked and um, beaten out of the, the inmates. Uh, Himmler has this very interesting notion of work and hygiene um, and um, Nazism, that somebody who, um, he, he refers frequently to um, the transformation that happens in the camps, supposedly, as being based around good hygiene, that they, and the, the people will be shown good hygiene, and that there is something unhygienic and dirty about um, the uh, the socialists who are arrested. Now, with, without plumbing the depths of um, Nazi psychoanalysis, one can only uh, make guesses as to, to what he means and what he's thinking. Um, but one more stable um, area to look at is the Nazis' notions of work. And as I've mentioned before, the, the Nazis believed work had this transformative quality, that hard labour would shut off the critical uh, faculties of the, the brain, which it was generally thought by most Nazis, um, most people were kind of unqualified 
to use and really only one great thinker existed and that was Adolf Hitler and that was about all you needed and instead the um, the, the real German character would come through um, that the um, these sort of lazy idle intellectual troublemakers that had never done a day's work in their lives they would know what it was to be German again by uh, using a pick and a spade and getting their hands dirty. And this is the, the kind of fantasy, really, that um, the, um, the, the Nazis uh, engaged in. Many of them were working class or, or lower middle class and extremely resentful of the, uh, the bourgeoisie. And whilst they were in, in no, mean, no way um, communists or uh, had a, a, a communist or socialist approach to eliminating the bourgeoisie, they themselves had a, a hatred of, of the kind of the condescension that they had probably received all their lives from the middle classes and the the sense that um, the, the middle classes who were um, uh, not experienced to hard work or sacrifice, the likes of which had occurred during the war, Uh, and all too inclined to embrace what the Nazis viewed as essentially foreign and cosmopolitan and rather alien ideas such as uh, socialism or modernism or anything that they suspected might have a kind of a slightly Jewish or internationalist slant to it. These are all the things that could be worked out of an individual um, if they were really uh, put through some kind of exhausting manual labour. One more curious aspect of the development of the camps, uh, beyond their kind of rapidly created, improvised uh, nature, Dachau, for example, was an old munitions factory which we with some barbed wire flung up around it, was the fact that so many SA men believed that they were in dire peril, that unless their enemies on the left were very quickly eliminated, that they would somehow manage to get the upper hand eventually and it would be the SA that would be in the concentration camps or being lined up against a wall and shot. And this is a really quite peculiar um, notion in a large part because it couldn't possibly have been further from the truth uh, by the end of 1933 The communist movement is comprehensively broken in Germany um, and has no prospect of reviving itself. It is fragmented, isolated, um, and it is still divided from the social democratic movement. Um, The experience in the camps for um, members of the KPD and the SPD is so extremely traumatic that the vast majority of them, when they leave the camps, there are many are the majority are discharged by within at least um, eighteen months. Um, they are um, unable to mount any kind of meaningful resistance outside. So you have. Uh, people constantly under fear of surveillance um, and fear of arrest who have um, probably very real uh, fears that that this might happen. Um, But the SA um, were genuinely of the opinion that um, unless this uh, violent and necessary work was done, it may well happen to them. Now, as you go through the uh, the Third Reich from the, the initial years through to a period of consolidation and centralisation, all the way through to, to the war, the nature of the camps changes again and again and again. They become more, um, for want of a better word, organised, um, structured, and the uh, state takes a far greater role uh, away from the kind of the grassroots of the SA in um, in coordinating the camps, and the camp, particularly Dachau, becomes a training school for the SS. Many of its alumni run the death camps in Poland during the war, 
and it becomes a, a site of, of best practice. And what are the practices that are really being learned here? They're the practices of efficient terror um, and how to uh, make torture as effective as, as possible, how to run a camp to make sure that the last vestiges of resistance are stamped out of the inmates. Uh, one might assume that this is you know, a straightforward practice. Evidently not. Um, the uh, time and energy that goes into perfecting methods of uh, psychological and social control within the camps of dehumanisation that are um, really, when you get to the war years, have become extremely advanced and, and sophisticated, for want, want of a better word. Um, these are uh, the camps, particularly Dachau, become almost laboratories for developing new, new systems of repression. It goes without saying, of course, that the the camps played an intrinsic role within Nazi Germany. Um, the speed and the scale of um, social and political revolution that Hitler wanted to bring about required camps, and it required the confinement of oppositional um, Figures and the uh, those who were um, likely to to object, and also it had a second role. It meant that not only was knowledge of the camp white camps widespread across Germany, um, and thus you know intimidating um, ordinary Germans, but they had a strangely kind of almost reassuring role for ordinary Germans. Um, who were aware of them, who could create a fiction for themselves that the camps were necessary, that they, because a place like a camp exists, it therefore, by extension, must contain dangerous people. They must be in there for a good reason, and therefore one can confer onto Herr Hitler um, a sense that he is doing the right thing, that he is protecting the, the uh, state and the people in a way that the weak Weimar government never could. And these sort of self-fulfilling justifications do an immense amount to, so, to cement Nazi power and Nazi support from the general public. Um, whenever you have these notions that um, flit around through society that, well, this thing must go without saying, it, it must go without saying, surely, that Hitler is doing this for the right reason, it always serves as, as an immensely strengthening, um, strengthening factor. People um, support dictatorships, particularly based on assumptions. And if it is assumed that society is surrounded by dangerous forces and you have the infrastructure of containment there, really for people to see. The only thing about Dachau, you could go past it, you could walk past it, you weren't allowed to peer over, you could get into some serious trouble um, for peering over the wall to have a look inside, though people were indeed fascinated by what was going on there. Um, it was both secretive but not a secret. Uh, if you contrast that with Stalin's gulags, Stalin's gulags were secret. They were they were known about, but they were secret. They were kind of open secrets, um, and you would have to uh, travel really quite a long way for most of them to uh, to get any any chance of seeing seeing one. Um, the the uh, Soviet trains that made their way to the gulags tended to timetable themselves so they went, if they were going through a town or a city they would go through at night, the station at night without stopping and um, or they would stop out in the, uh, in the in the countryside if they needed to with Hitler it was far more palatable that Dachau be known to exist, however what happened inside it was uh, best kept best kept a secret anyway i will be uh, back this time next week with another explaining history podcast for you 
If you are a student of Nazi Germany or if you are a teaching Nazi Germany, uh, you can catch me this autumn uh, with Richard Kennett. We will be doing for uh, Hodder a, uh, a double uh, webinar and um, it'll be brilliant, I assure you, And uh, on Nazi Germany uh, 1933 to 1945. Anyway, check out in the podcast for more details and for your special 10% off promotional code. Thanks. Bye-bye.